Hi, Nalia. I think you're on mute at the moment. Did. Okay. Here we go. So, hi, my name is Malia. I'm thrilled to be here tonight with all of you to celebrate the Zoology Museum's 50th birthday and to share with you some of my experiences working with the collections. First, how did I get involved with the museum? Well, I stepped off a plane in Aberdeen Airport on a dark and rainy, cold afternoon in early September 2009. It had been a long two-day trip from Anchorage, Alaska. Within a couple weeks of my arrival, my husband suffered a medical emergency that had him in and out of the hospital for a several months. It was quite a shock, and I, in a new country far from family and friends, had little to structure my world. I felt time drag. Daily, I took long walks to and from the hospital and wandered far across the city to distract myself from worry. Then one day, a colleague of my husband's, knowing I had worked in museums before coming to Scotland, introduced me to Dr. Downs in her then office in the Zoology Museum. Down into the basement of the Zoology building we went. I remember the brightly lit gallery space with dozens of large display cases, brimming full of taxidermy creatures, skeletons, large and small, jars of specimens and other curiosities. After introductions, we uh, toured through the narrow, windy hallway and alcoves and small rooms, which revealed cabinets and cabinets and drawers and shelvings packed with more and more specimens. And so many taxidermy birds from all over the world. As a birder, I was thrilled. It was cluttered, it was dusty, and it seemed kind of forgotten, but museum work was being done. I was enchanted and hooked, and soon I was a zoology museum volunteer. I felt my life come back into focus with purpose. Volunteering with the zoology collections led to other volunteer projects with the university museums, and I was thrilled when I was hired on as the curatorial assistant. From 2009 to 2017, I worked mainly with Dr. Downs. In the course of this work, I felt very fortunate to have some wonderful experiences assisting her with small and large projects within the Zoology Museum, uh, discovering lost zoology specimens in the course of producing exhibitions or other work, and developing a strong volunteer program, all of which contributed to a transformation of the Zoology Museum galleries, improvements in collections care, and increased engagement with students and the public that continues today. My introduction to the zoology collections was working on uh, a documentation project, which was part of a larger university-wide project to document all the collections. In the Zoology Museum, I worked alongside other volunteers and recorded specimen information and location. These records were later updated into the database and the database loaded onto our online um, a database accessible to the public. This is all part of the accreditation process for museums. Following up on this hands-on project, it was clear that more needed to be done. So we also worked to improve housekeeping and pest control procedures, which is always a challenge with zoology collections where various insects pet, insect pests love to feast on furred and feathered specimens. I established an integrated pest monitoring program and collections care protocol um, and this involved regularly scheduled cleaning of galleries, the display cases, specimens, monitoring pest traps, and regularly checking of known vulnerable specimens to check for it, pests. From time to time, and especially in the autumn, we might have a pest outbreak, which meant all hands on deck with mitigation procedures and emergency cleaning, conservation work, and, so, and making great use of the new 30 below freezer for killing damaging insect larvae on specimens. Housekeeping in a large museum is labor intensive and we needed more hands. The Zoology Museum had had volunteers over the years, but we wanted to work with a team and maintain that team or pool of interested university student volunteers that would work alongside us long term. In 2012, I began recruiting volunteers uh, from across the university. Uh, they, and we had volunteers uh, interested from anthropology, museum studies, especially biology, archaeology, and other departments, and even from time to time had a few professionals help us out. Had a team of four to five work all together one afternoon, usually scheduled on a Wednesday afternoon. 
We taught the volunteers various museum skills in object handling, object cleaning, minor conservation tasks, housekeeping and pest management procedures. They assisted in opening cases, old and, tr old and tricky as they were with big glass panels, which required uh, glass uh, glaze, glazer suckers to take them off. We cleaned the specimens and prepared them for freezing and updated various documents uh, according to our needs. We, they also assisted with other museum activities and events like our popular event night at the museum. In later years, these volunteers also helped plan, research, and prepare small exhibitions for display in the museum. In the years I worked with the Zoology Museum volunteers, we had about 20 to 30 volunteers that passed through, some of which stayed with us for years. We provided reference, references for many of our volunteers as they sought further work or unemployment in the sector. One of my most rewarding experiences with the Zoology Museum was working on the ground, uh, being seconded to work on the ground, coordinating many aspects of the recognition capital project, for which our volunteer program was key. This was a project funded by Museum Gallery Scotland for 50,000 pounds with significant additional funding from the University of States for a total budget of over 82,000 pounds. The purpose was to improve the gallery spaces, which were old and tired and needed some improvement and, and, and the public access to the collections. We did this with new display cases, interpretive graphics for new exhibitions, and a change of the old case layout. Here should be a, so a slide of what the museum used to look like. Um, for many years, this is what it looked like when it was first installed in about 1970s uh, and what we changed. So the purpose was to improve the gallery spaces and public access to collections with these cases. And it also included in, in adding new LED track lighting to reduce the damage, as you can see, by all these fluorescent lights. Estates also helped us out with new paint and new flooring to improve the overall atmosphere. And we added new signage to improve visitor access so they could find the museum being in the lower basement as it was for our main gallery. We also added additional storage space uh, that was also display space in the gallery foyer and new mobile shelving in our bird store. The project ran from August 2012 to November 2013, although we began preparations months in advance. The project was successful in transforming the galleries and collections and many spin-off projects resulted, including a smaller project funded by Museum Gallery Scotland to change the display case lighting to LED track, which took another year. Our volunteers were key to achieving our goals with these projects as display cases had to be completely emptied multiple times so they could be moved ahead of contractor work, like installing the flooring, or the case lighting alongside other collection care needs. Another project that made it possible, that was made possible by the Recognition Capital Project was the Taxidermy Bird Project. This involved relocating all our vulnerable and in some cases unsecured bird taxidermy specimens stored in ratty tatty metal cabinets in the zoology building. These birds were stored in public, these birds in the metal cabinets were stored in public corridors, uh, in the private back hallways, in miscellaneous areas throughout the museum. We wanted to move them into our new storage cases in the gallery floor in the new mobile shelving. We had over 20 tall metal cabinets with shelving filled with over 200 international and local important taxidermy bird specimens. Volunteers were critical to completing this project. Birds and bird displays were, were clean, then wrapped in plastic to protect from dust and potential pests and frozen for about a week. When they came out of the freezer and slowly came back up to room temperature, they were then often left wrapped and moved into the, store, the new storage area or into this storage area where they were unwrapped and put on display. These cases had uh, glass fronts so that the public could view what we put in them. And this was important to get sometimes new specimens out on that hadn't been on display for uh, many years. 
Meeting one afternoon a week for years, the volunteers and I nearly completed moving all of these bird specimens by the time I left in 2017. With the final few moved and the final inventory completed sometime in 2018 by Hannah Clark. Working closely with the zoology collections revealed many treasures among its specimens. A few of the highlights include the Mata Mata, the Jordan's Courser Egg, and the Passenger Pigeon. The Mata Mata Turtle, a rather huge and ugly taxidermy full of character and well loved by the staff, had been on display in the Zoology Museum since the beginning. It was thought to have been collected by botanist James Trail in the 1870s or 1880s when he went to the Amazon on a collecting expedition, but this was not noted in our documents. While working on the research phase of my favorite exhibition, Aberdonians in the Americas, we were able to definitively link information in newly found records that identified this turtle as one that Trail collected for a very satisfying specimen rediscovery. Another highlight was putting together a display about the Jordan's Courser, a bird native, a, a shorebird-like bird native to um, India. Presumed extinct since 1935, a few birds were rediscovered in a very restricted range in India in 1986. Few specimens of this bird or its egg exist in, in, in museums across the world, and some of those have been lost. University of Aberdeen had a egg presumed to be a Jordan's courser. Using innovative DNA techniques and comparing with other known specimens, researchers concluded it was indeed a Jordan's courser egg and another fine rediscovery for the museum. Another of my favorite specimens, ah, this, is, this is the Jordan's courser egg, uh, and this was uh, long hidden. Uh, another of my favorite specimens in the Zoology Museum is the passenger pigeon. Uh, this specimen uh, was purchased long ago for the Zoology Museum and is only one of about 2,000 specimens in all museum collections around the world. It is a key specimen in the zoology collections, highlighting human impact on ecosystems and climate change use in many exhibitions. I worked with zoology volunteer one-on-one uh, -on -one in 2014 to display uh, pass the passenger uh, to to display this passenger pigeon and mark the centennial of the bird's extinction in North America. There was a wealth of content made available uh, to uh, to the public uh, and for use by other institutions by uh, museums across the United States to uh, mark this uh, sad anniversary. I feel very fortunate to have been a part of the existing projects on the exhibitions and, the and, and the, especially the volunteer program at the Zoology Museum. There is certainly much more work to be done, however, and various projects continue. I will now hand this over to Hannah Clark. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Amelia, for handing over to me this evening. Um, I'm really excited to be able to tell you about one of our current projects. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our current work, um, including the Marvellous Mollusk project, which we began in March this year. During the lockdown period, we had to work from home, just like most other people in the UK. However, we were very mindful that we would like to tackle a new collections based project and we were finally able to begin working with the museum collections again. The Mollusk collection was an area that had been previously identified as one which would benefit from a project to improve its storage and accessibility. As you can see from these two images, although some of the shells were contained in their own specimen boxes, the majority were stored in small poly bags and were piled several days deep, therefore causing damage and making them difficult to locate and access for research purposes. As an institutional member of the Natural Science Collections Association, or NATSCA, we were made aware of a small project funding stream offered by the association on an annual basis, and that this was still available for applications during the pandemic. Having then applied for and been successful in our application, the University Museums, with the support from NATSCA's Bill Petit Memorial Award, 
committed to undertaking a project to rehouse and improve the accessibility of the Zoology Museum's mollusk collection. It was agreed that the primary goals would be to encourage and reignite use of the mollusk collection through both internal and external research, whilst improving their storage for future longevity. The project would not only include those specimens currently in storage, but also those on display within the Zoology Museum's lower gallery. The main areas of focus during the project will be to rehouse the collection to the highest possible conservation standards, to ensure that all specimens had an up-to-date museum catalogue record and that all accompanying labels and data would also be entered into these records. One of the biggest improvements would be to update the taxonomic names of the specimens, as the majority of these are now outdated or unrecognised. Throughout the project, we hope that we could raise awareness of this comprehensive research collection by releasing social media, blog and web page posts therefore encouraging use of the collections by academics, researchers and students alike. We also propose to install a new small display in the foyer of the School of Biological Sciences building, which would focus on the MOLUS project, as well as the research and teaching value of the university's natural history collections. Here you can see our current timeline for the work, which we have had to adjust slightly as the project has progressed due to increased workloads in other areas of the museum collections. However, we have just completed the loose boxes of specimens and have now moved on to rehousing and updating the specimens in drawers inside the larger permanent storage cabinets. So how did we begin and what resources did we use? We initially sourced and costed for the conservation materials required for the project such as new crystal boxes, plaster zone, specimen labels and acid-free tissue paper, which would allow us to rehouse the collection to the best possible standards. As we began rehousing, we also updated the specimen records on our collections management database, CALM, ensuring that we cross-referenced original hard copy catalogues and transcribed the data from any old labels, as often important collection or identification information has been missed off the database record. We also cleaned and repaired any damaged specimens before putting them into their new boxes. We were very lucky in that we were able to secure a subject specialist in the form of a lecturer in marine biology from the University School of Biological Sciences Department to consult on the project. They were able to identify the trickier specimens, which lacked accompanying data, as well as sharing their valuable knowledge with the rest of the team. We were also supported by the wider Natsuka community who are always open to sharing their knowledge and providing curatorial support to other institutions. In order to update the taxonomy, taxonomy of the mollusks, we use specialist online resources such as the World Register of Marine Species or WORMS database, as well as comparing our specimens with other well-documented malacology collections, such as those at the National Museum of Wales, the Natural History Museum London and the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle Paris. We also used reference books held in the university's library online research papers, as well as archival material held within the Zoology Museum's collection itself. Here is our very small team of two. Our specialist was Dr. Cara Layton, lecturer in marine biology, and myself, assistant curator for collections access. So as with any project, we faced a few challenges along the way. The main challenge facing us was the ongoing pandemic, as this limited our access to the collection initially, and we were also unable to use any volunteers on this project. The pandemic also had a large impact on the companies supplying the project materials which we required. Our initial supplier of crystal boxes ceased manufacturing the product line, and many other known UK suppliers unfortunately folded due to the impact of the pandemic and Brexit supply chain issues on their businesses. This therefore meant searching for new manufacturers who could supply us with the same product for similar to the original costing. After several phone calls and discussions around quantities, shipping and timescales, we eventually managed to secure the boxes, albeit several months later than we had initially anticipated. In terms of existing issues within the collections itself, we had to tackle illegible handwriting on labels and in catalogues, specimens which had come away from the mounts on display, and many specimens which didn't have existing database records. In fact, it soon became apparent that the majority of specimens which did have accession numbers and museum labels 
actually didn't have database records, but instead only had entries in the original handwritten catalogues from the 1960s. However, as well as challenges, we also had successes. So far in the project, we have rehoused and updated over 500 specimen records, many of which record up to 10 or more of the same species collected at any one time. We have found new collector names on old labels. We have identified specimens from all over the world, far more than we had expected, and the new storage methods have actually increased the usable space inside each storage cabinet. We have also made some new discoveries, such as the rare crusty nautilus shell we found in a drawer labelled miscellaneous. The crusty nautilus, which is found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, was thought to have become extinct in 1986 as it hadn't been seen for several decades. Then in 2015, one lone creature was seen off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Since then, scientists have discovered that all nautilus species are suffering from species decline due to the fact that each species live in small isolated groups and they can only inhabit a narrow range of ocean depth. Here are a few key pieces of data from the project so far. We have found that only 24% of the specimens which had existing accession numbers actually had database records, and that the collection comprises of material from all over the world, such as Asia, America, Oceania, and Africa, as well as the United Kingdom. You can also see that as the university began to transition from online to blended learning in September this year, that this had some effect on the project, as staff members had to prioritize their workload in order to supply support teaching and research requests. So in summary, as the project has evolved, it's become increasingly clear that the scale of the task at hand is much larger than initially anticipated. As such, we are aware that there will be ongoing work to complete after the initial project deadline of March 22, 2022. The wonderful discoveries that have already been made have further validated just how important this project is for widening access to future research of this rich and diverse collection, and we can't wait to see what we might uncover next. Thank you for listening to my talk this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much to both of our speakers there for sharing a little bit about history and what they're passionate about with us. That was absolutely fantastic. Sorry for the delay there. I'm having a little bit of a connection issue this evening, but I think we're okay for just now. <laughs> um, so we're gonna open up for questions and discussion. You know, we've got plenty of time um, to answer everyone's questions and you know, to get a little bit more insight into um, the museum and um, volunteering and, and kind of the history of that. So if you have anything you want to ask, please do um, put that in the chat. And um, we have got the first question here. And we've also got another um, member of staff um, on hand, Jenny Downs. She's one, another one of the museum staff who might be able to answer some of our questions as well. So Jenny, you can keep an ear out and see um, which ones you think you might be best to answer. Um, so we'll go with the first one is, um, would it be possible to give a brief history of who was involved in the museum's creation? I'm wondering if any of our speakers know a little bit about that. I'll, I'll respond quickly if anybody has um, more to say, please add. I mean, it has multiple origins because um, some of the collections go back to the 19th um, or even early 18th century. Um, but sadly, a lot of them have become dissociated from the records of who originally connected them. Um, so we know that, for, that Professor McGillibray um, collected a huge amount of the um, birds in the museum, but some of, we, we found it difficult to um, Find, reunite them with the records and find out which they were. Um, trail uh, professor of botany also contributed and that was one of the reasons why the Matamata turtle discovery was so exciting because we were able to find one of the early museum specimens. Um, so the sort of the 19th century museum used to be housed down at Marshall um, where there's, there are some phenomenal photos of it um, in the old um, hall at Marshall with sort of antlers everywhere and um, start, it's kind of, I love looking at these because you can recognise um, some of the specimens that you're familiar with from the museum as it stands but they're kind of kind of like spot the difference they're all over the place um it was so it used to be um 
in the in Marshall and um, some of the things like the articulated skeletons um, were there and they were all um, moved up to the um, zoology building in the 1970s so it's been and there was also a small collection um, dating from the 19th century on site in um, King's College so these kind of merged and became modern zoology collection um, but there's been added to over the years through teaching and research as well so it's been it, it, a lot, but quite a, a lot of the um, specimens are sort of older than you think um, and date back to the 19th century we've got a little page about the University Museum's history which um, I'm going to stick in the chat for um, further interest and a cool picture of the zoology museum as it used to look in Marshall there it is Hannah Malia anything to add to that um, I was just going to add that um, quite a lot of the articulated skeletons were actually acquired in sort of early to mid 1800s during the time when comparative anatomy was really championed so so most of the large um, uh, skeletons that we have would have come from that time when comparative anatomy was being taught at Marshall College, particularly by um, Professor Struthers, who was Regis Chair of Anatomy at the time. Yes, that way, if you go into the zoology foyer, there's an enormous um, whale flippers and um, collarbone, and that, that was one of the Struthers specimens, and he was trying, by, by comparative anatomy, um, he was a fervent um, uh, proponent of Darwinism and he was trying to um, show that he, structures in the human body and structures in the animal body had common ancestors so he was looking at things like the flippers of whales and seeing that though they look like a fin you know they've actually got five digits in there and are comparable to the human hand so that was why he was he, he had he um, hugely contributed to the anatomy connection collections as well um, and that was why he was collecting zoological um, and anatomical specimens to look at evolution. That's great. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for answering that question. Um, the next question is, will any of the newly discovered specimens go on display soon? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so we are planning to display um, a selection of the newly discovered mollusks in the um, Sir Duncan Rice Library Gallery next year um, with, in our first um, reopening exhibition. So the, the theme of, we're still trying to decide on the title, so I can't tell you what the title is exactly, but the theme is news from the museum. So um, sort of all the um, things that have still been happening while we're in lockdown, the discoveries we've made. Um, so one of those will be a case of marvellous mollusks. And I'm really looking forward to seeing these because um, there's some just beautiful things there. Yeah, can I just add as well that we're also going to make another small display, which will be in the foyer of the School of Biological Sciences. Um, which will just be about the project, but also about the um, university museum's collections um, for using using them as a research resource and for teaching, because I think that's something we'd really love to highlight as part of the, one of the outcomes as part of this project. That sounds incredible, sounds very interesting. I can't wait to get back and start seeing exhibitions again. It's going to be fantastic. Um, the next question is, how was the process of conserving and maintaining these items? Um, changed in the last 50 years? Um, that's a really good Hannah. question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hannah, 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 you, can, you, can, well, you can probably answer that better with your cons conservator's background. Yeah, so, um, so as with anything, um, conservation practices have changed with the times and as we've um, had access to more and more types of um, scientific um, research, we've been able to understand a lot more how um, objects and particular materials react um, and how we're able to um, apply certain treatments to them to in order to either um, prevent this or to rectify um, issues. So, so definitely conservation practices has, have changed a lot um, because I think we have a better understanding of, of material science and the, and the types of materials that we use to conserve objects now and how that can have effect on, on the objects in the long term. Um, I know Melia had done a lot of preventative um, conservation treatment in her time and I'm the same so um, so it's one of the things that we do a lot um, as Melia already highlighted particularly the the housekeeping aspects is, is an ongoing thing that you have to keep on top of um, uh, in order to prevent any any real real damage occurring. 
That's great, thank you. And the next question is to uh, both of our speakers tonight. Um, which is your favourite specimen in the museum? <laughs> well, I'll take that one first, I guess. Um, well, I'm I'm an avid birder, and so I love all the bird specimens. But I think one of my favourite is the lyre bird, which is on the open display. I think we saw a picture of it in one of the display cases. They mimic um, crazy sounds like car alarms and everything. They're from Australia. And I think those specimens that we had are really beautiful. They have a, a long tail, kind of like a peacock, and the males are very loud when they're mimicking their calls. I've heard recordings of them. But also my background is uh, kind of as an archaeologist, and a lot of my research was uh, with um, animal remains, particularly birds, in uh, in archaeological sites, and so one of the things that really struck me about the museum and I loved were the skeletons. I just I loved all of these articulated skeletons, and I've always wanted to put one together. I never have, um, but there's a lot of bird skeletons in the museum as well. Uh, but I I just I love all the skeletons. A snake skeleton is just phenomenal, but those are mine. Um, I probably agree with you on, um, in terms of one of the birds. I particularly like the Lamagia, which is up in the upper gallery, um, just because it's such an impressive specimen. It's also quite quite an old specimen as well. But I like the Lamagia because it's the only bird that can digest bone in its stomach acid, which I think is just incredible. Um, and it just looks amazing as well. And I would also agree about the skeletons as well, like some of the some of the impressive articulated skeletons that we have, such as the elephant in the foyer, which is interesting in terms of its history and, and its story and where it came from. Um, yeah. Can I do one? I was going to say, Jenny, do you want to jump in as well? Yeah, to do one. Um, I like the Kellis cat. Um, it's that they are. Um, it just it sort of looks just like a, a giant stuffed black cat. They're hybrids of Scottish wild cats and um, domestic cats that have created a kind of um, stable hybrid that reproduces more cats that look like that and they were sort of they were thought to be um kind of like a myth that there are these large black cats around in Scotland and then some um specimens were actually found I think you know due to being roadkill sadly um but I like it particularly because and it's similar to what Malia said on my first visit to Aberdeen when I came up to here for an interview I'd been reading about these for some reason I was kind of interested in them um, cryptozoology and mythical or, or semi-mythical creatures and I walked into the foyer of the Zoology Museum and there it was in the cabinet and I was like wow this, this place has Keller's cats how amazing um, so that's one that's always been one of my favorite specimens it's in um, the one of the new displays that we did during the recognition project to talk about e evolution so if you uh, you can see it um, compared to a Scottish wildcat um, but yeah I think that's my favorite that's brilliant thanks so much to all of you for the answers um, the next question is, how active um, is the museum in, in, in acquiring new collections and what is the focus? So I guess I can have a go at answering that one. So um, the university museums do have a collecting policy and we do actively collect. Um, however, um, at the forefront, we're always thinking about looking after the existing collections. So it's not something that we sort of actively go and seek but if we're approached we would definitely um, look at any specimens that are being offered to us. The issue we have is that we don't have um, any preparators so this is something that it, um, is not unusual in the UK. In the US you do tend to have whole departments of preparators so that's people that would prepare um, skins or specimens that had come in um, for display whereas we don't have that so we wouldn't be actively looking to acquire um, any um, specimens that would need any preparation, but we would um, accept historical specimens if they fell within our collecting policy. And our collecting policy kind of states the type of material that we um, would be looking to acquire, and it would be things that would either fit with our current co uh, collections, so we would need to assess whether they'd fit within our current collections, or whether they're going to add anything to our current collections, so add anything in terms of interpretation or understanding. Um, and you can find our collections policy on our website, it's open for everyone to have a look at. So if you did have anything that you would be looking to donate, I would definitely recommend having a look at our collections policy initially. 
I'm putting a link to the um, collecting policy in the chat. Yeah, I'd, I would add to that. Um, one of the issues in people donating things is often um, that if it's sort of something that's been in someone's attic or something, it doesn't have accompanying scientific records. And if it doesn't have something saying, you know, date and place of collection or where it actually came from, it's actually not. Um, that much use as a museum specimen so we sometimes um, sort of get offered things that are interesting but they don't fit with our collecting policy in that way if we don't have it if it doesn't have the information um, that we're looking for but we would collect for um, either sort of things that were significantly associated with the university research and teaching or if it was something um, that was for your interpretation and display and we really want it was something that we thought kind of had a public um, average potential but I'd say the days of, of um, huge amounts of specimens coming into the museum um, are in the past really and we do have to think about kind of you know looking after the ones we have uh, um, which although there's great progress being made on the restorages we've heard I mean that's the case the, there's still there's that balance and that's the case for all museum collections really it would that could be true for human culture too that's great thanks very much Gabe um, the next question is what would your dream project be to work on once the marvelous mollusk project finishes That's a really hard question because there, there are so many areas of the collection which are still undiscovered, as, as it were, um, in terms of research potential. Um, and so I think it's really hard to sort of specify a particular area. One of the one of the areas that I am looking at, um, looking into working on next um, is the McGregor bird collection, which Malia will know a lot about the study skins that came from McGregor, um, because we had a researcher actually um, come and look at those a good few years ago when, when Malia was still with us, um, and over in um, Australia, and they're about to publish um, their findings. So they they were looking to locate all of the um, specimens that William McGregor collected fr from Papua New Guinea, and we have a really substantial collection. Um, and a lot of them have um, really lovely handwritten data labels which McGregor attached to them so it'd be really wonderful to be able to go through those and add in that data onto the database and make it more accessible to um, other people as well. Jenny do you have a project that you have in mind or? <laughs> I was going to say Antarctic collections. Um, I keep hearing rumours that there are some birds that were associated with the last Shackleton expedition, um, and I'm really interested in Antarctic exploration, but I haven't had a chance to look into this fully. I know there's stuff in the herbarium, so yeah, I would like to do um, a project about that and hopefully find out more. You sound really interesting. Thanks. Um, uh, Lauren is asking, what is the story of the elephant skeleton mentioned by Hannah? Um, so the elephant skeleton was collected and I believe it was about 1906. I may be wrong, maybe a couple of years out, but I believe it's 1906. Um, and it was sent by a Dr. John Gunn from Multan in India. And it was sent to Professor Struthers to form part of the um, comparative anatomy teaching collections, which were uh, then housed in Marshall College. Um, and it took, um, it took uh, about two years to clean and prepare. Um, it took it took 18 months to ship from from India, and then it took about two years for the to be prepared. And that that would have been prepared in house by um, technicians at the time. So this was when um, the comparative anatomy department had their own technicians who would have looked after the specimens. So I just think it's quite an interesting story. We don't know a lot about John Gunn. We know he had connections with um, Struthers. So again, that might be another nice little project in the future to do a bit of research into him. That's great. Thank you. Um, Chloe had just put in the in the chat there kind of a, a note to our audience and um, saying that anyone local to Aberdeen you know the zoology is, uh, museum is somewhere that we remember vividly from childhood and she said I'm sure I'm not alone and it's absolutely I remember that from when I was a kid and also I used to work in an after school club um, and like a summer club and we used to take the kids um, to the zoology museum during school holidays and it was always one of the top things on their list that they wanted to do and um, when we were planning activities such a big part of I think the history in Aberdeen and um, I would have uh, would like to know from all three of you um, what's you what first inspired uh, each of you in your sort of love of museums and, and, and zoology and collections Malia do you want to go first yeah that's <laughs> real I was just struggling to get my mic back on so um, well I mean for me 
I love the stories that go with objects. For me, those are really what connect connect you to the to, to each object, the story, and kind of make it relevant today. And I love the ability of like natural history collections to inform us about you know climate change, um, finding new species, which are you know often it's often found in in museums today. And there's just so much to be learned and the surprises that come out of working with the collections and learning these important stories about both the people that may have collected those and, and that, that other people in how, how that specimen is then used in the museum. I think that's, those are amazing stories. Yeah, I completely agree with what you just said, Malia. Um, I would say that from my personal kind of um, point of view, like I used to love uh, visiting museums um, as a child and um, was really interested in um, sort of um, the kind of the arts and the practical side of things and it was only when I started to think about well what kind of job could I do and I, I really loved doing something practical and hands-on that that was always my strength so um, and that's how I got into the field of conservation and so from there conservation and, and curatorial kind of practice go hand in hand so I think that that's kind of that's kind of what inspired me to, to, to work in museums. And as you said, Malia, the, the great thing about working in a museum is that you can uncover these stories that maybe many people have never, you know, seen before or heard before and, or, or for many hundreds of years until you find them again. So, and being able to share those with, with other people is, is wonderful. Yeah, it's a, it's a continuing, it's kind of like a you work every day you come in and it's like a continual inspiration. Uh, working with all this. It's awesome. Jenny, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'm not sure. My parents, when I was a child, had a sort of box of curiosities and strange things from around the world, and I used to play at uh, making displays of them and writing little labels, so it may um, go back a long while as <laughs> it's something that I enjoyed, but I didn't, I didn't um, sort of realise that it was something I could do for a career until quite a bit later in life, and that was when I was doing a history PhD, and I was in a department that had a very strong link between um, the university teaching and research and the departmental museum. This was the Whipple Museum of History of Science in Cambridge. So, and you know, I'd kind of done an undergraduate history degree and it was all about reading books and I hadn't really thought about museum objects for some time except for going to them when I was on holiday. But I started doing, writing essays um, that were about objects in the museum and that kind of got my interest going. I volunteered there and then I sort of thought, hang on, you know, I could be doing this all the time I could do it as a career so that was kind of I think it, it was uh, and I think that's really important for a, or a university museum um, kind of makes these collections and links with students and um, brings out the collections for um, learning like that so yeah I think it but but, but I, think, I think I'd always kind of had a, a, a museum-y you know interesting character um, but I might not have realized that it was a career path. Thank you very much. Um, I have to read out this comment and uh, and, and it's actually a question as well um, that we've just got in. So um, Fiona is saying, when I was an undergrad in the late 80s, I spent many happy hours in the coffee room of the foyer being overseen by the slightly moth-eaten, strange looking tiger who was hidden there. Last time I visited Aberdeen over 10 years ago, he had been moved into the main museum. I was delighted to see this as we were all very attached to him. Is he still there? Actually, he may be a she. The museum has always been a wonderful place. So where is the tiger now, team? Um, Malia will know. <laughs> um, so the tiger is actually on top of our other tiger specimen. So Ronnie the tiger uh, is in our own case. And then the other tiger specimen, which I believe um, uh, we're talking about, is, uh, is actually on top of that. Um, and one of the main reasons for putting the tiger up there as, as has been said in the comments, is that it was very much loved and I'm sure um, petted on occasion. Um, and so um, so its whiskers and, and its ears are very, well, it's missing its whiskers, they're gone, and, uh, and its ears are almost gone. Um, and so <laughs> um, in some, some ways you have to be cruel to be kind and so it had to be moved uh, up high where it couldn't be touched anymore. I didn't know that that used to be in the coffee room. That is really interesting. <laughs> Imagine what that tiger must have seen. 
I can just imagine many, many faces passing through over the years. Um, the next question um, we'll go with, um, do you think that any items uh, in the collection will ever be returned to their country of origin, like the Benin bronze has been recently? Um, so Jenny might be able to speak a bit about this, I'm not sure, but I was just going to mention that um, as with a lot of museums, um, which has been in the media recently, a lot of people are looking to um, decolonize their collections, and this also applies to natural history collections as well. Um, as with any collection, it's difficult to um, understand the full history of an object unless you have really uh, excellent documentation that accompanies it. And as we sort of mentioned previously, a lot, a lot of time with um, natural history um, specimens, you maybe don't have that information that accompanies it, and it does require a lot of research. So um, it would be wonderful to um, be able to start to look at the potential of um, decolonizing the museum, but that would involve um, a large research project in order to start piecing together the stories and histories that are associated with the specimens. That's very true what Hannah says about research and it's, a, it's something um, kind of unusual about the Ben and Bronze repatriation as well which is that it, it was proactive um, on behalf of the University of Aberdeen Museums. It wasn't in response to a request because I'm not sure, I don't think anybody knew that we had it. Um, it was a, um, a consequence of a collections review um, that identified this as something that had been um, acquired immorally. So yeah collections reviews and documentation is absolutely crucial to this. Um, I think it's it's quite probable that there will be more. Um, the, there's a very specific repatriation policy. I'm sticking a link to that in the chat as well in case anybody wants to um, look at it. So we, um, any request would be considered um, by all parties according to these criteria and according to sort of what the specific um, object was. From our end, we continue to um, research the collections and try and make information about the collections more available. And it's quite, I think, they're may well be um, more repatriations that come about as a result of that, but I don't yet know what they would be. Um, yes, few, uh, it's um, Ben and Bronze is perhaps is sort of specific in having these very strong cultural associations and that to, to repatriate something you have to um, be able to trace back exactly who it originally belonged to and also know that they you know these whoever this was they have to want it back um so that's not always the case for everything um but yeah i think that uh, i think it is possible and or indeed likely that there will be some more but i don't can't yet say what that would be great thank you very much and um, i'd like to know going back to the volunteering um topic uh, how many volunteers do you have currently like and and particularly in comparison to um, when Malia was there and um, you know working with that group at that point and also now that they're back what's their current focus? So we haven't actually been able to start volunteering back just quite yet um, but we hope to be able to in the new year um, just because of um, Covid guidelines so we're still adhering to university's wider Covid guidelines so um, once um, once they are reviewed again, we'll be able to see whether that is possible to get volunteers back. However, we have been using volunteers to work on um, uh, online uh, material for us and also for our social media. And we're also looking at um, getting some volunteers to work remotely on transcribing some old catalogues for us potentially as well. Um, but we do have um, quite a few volunteers on the waiting list um, because of course every year we have a new intake and there's often quite a lot of students in, from all different um, uh, uh, courses, not just, um, not just ones relating to um, working in museums such as the Museum Studies course, but also from a lot of the different bio biology courses, history courses, archaeology. So we have a quite a big waiting list just now. So we're hoping to be able to try and rotate um, rotate the volunteering so that everyone does eventually get a chance. Um, but it can be tricky because um, we're quite a small team, so we have to ensure that we have um, the relevant number of staff members in order to supervise a certain amount of students um, or volunteers. So at the moment, we're hoping to get at least two or three volunteers back into zoology, um, doing the actual practical hands-on work in, in the very near future. Um, but it is hoped that we're going to undertake a housekeeping 
session before Christmas to essentially put the collections to bed, as it were, um, which we'd hope to get a lot more volunteers involved, when, involved in because it will then mean that everyone would get a chance to do the same sort of hands on housekeeping work, which we wouldn't usually be able to do. Good, thanks very much, Hannah. Um, how closely um, do you work with other universities across the UK and natural history and zoology museums? So um, I don't know if Jenny, if you wanted to talk about UMIS and that um, connection, um, but we, as with the Snatska project, so we're working with a specialist um, network um, and Natska uh, encompasses um, people from all different uh, areas of museums and natural history work, um, as well as um, independent businesses as well. So um, this network is, is quite a wide network and it means that we can um, they're very friendly as well and open to um, knowledge exchanges is wonderful. So it means that we can ask questions uh, and get some great advice from specialists who are working in those areas. Um, we also um, work with um, other museums such as those in the local area. Um, and we do collaborate with them. So recently, for example, we've just um, loaned some objects to Provost Skeen's house for the Aberdeen City reopening. Um, of that so there are some objects from our collections there um, so we do do a lot of loan work as well and, and research so we, we, we do um, loan materials for research um, as well. Yeah, I was going to say something. UMIS is um, University Museums in Scotland. Um, we're very active within this network and recently um, the uh, partnership officer, the wonderful Sarah Burry Hayes, has been appointed. So UMIS has been become a lot more active and we're doing a lot of social media um, together. Um, we are hopefully when uh, in-person events become um, more possible again we'll sort of we'll work on that as well so uh, we, we have strong connections with other um, university museums across Scotland some of which um, include zoology particularly um, in Dundee which has got a great zoology museum um, so yeah there's kind of the, the, there's quite a lot of um, of connection with that but but that that runs across all um, themes not just zoology yeah the web Susan just put a link to their web page has just been set up that's great, thank you, Jenny. Um, I think that actually might be it for questions. And um, we do have more time if anyone's got anything that they would like to ask before we wrap up. Um, it's always worth mentioning, of course, that if you come up with something later that you'd wanted to find more about or you know any other questions, you can always email that to us at alumni at abdn.ac.uk and we can pass that on to the speakers that are here tonight and we can get your answer after the event. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that there's any other questions at the moment. So as I said, please do feel free to reach out if you have anything after the session, You'd be very welcome to do so. Um, so all that's left really for me to do is say a huge, huge thank you um, to all of our speakers tonight, um, uh, Melia, uh, Hannah and Jenny for taking the time to join us and to um, and really engage with the questions and answers as well and, and give such good uh, feedback to, to everybody that asked a question tonight. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and it was you know, great to hear, you know, a bit about the history of the volunteering and, and see what, where the things are going now. So um, we will, of course, be working with you again in the future. I'm positive uh, for more virtual events and hopefully in 2022, we'll get to do some in-person um, alumni stuff with your team as well, which we're all very much looking forward to. Um, so a huge, huge thank you to everyone who joined us and took the time out tonight to, to come along. We hope that you've enjoyed it. And again, thank you to the team and we'll hopefully see you at another event soon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>